Welcome to another enlightening episode of Roots to Foods. I'm your host, Ovidiu Bojoran, Technical Director for Partnerships and Investments with AV Ventures, the impact investing arm of ACDI Vocal, a 60-year-old nonprofit based in Washington, D.C. Today, we step into the revolutionary realm of precision agriculture, a cutting-edge approach that is reshaping the landscape of farming and agribusiness. As we navigate through the fields of technology, data analytics, and sustainable practices, we are privileged to have with us executives, experts, and entrepreneurs who have been instrumental in shaping the landscape of precision agriculture. Joining us is Paul Schickler. Paul was president of DuPont Pioneer, now Corteva AgriScience, the advanced seed genetics business of DuPont. Corteva is the sixth ranked company in the U.S and the 15th globally by revenues in agri-science. In this role, Paul expanded Pioneer Global Business by advancing innovation that improves local productivity and profitability for farmers throughout the world. Paul currently serves on the board of directors of Drake University, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, and the World Food Prize Foundation. Our second speaker is Brian Bossier, who is a Kenyan innovator, thinker, and entrepreneur with a focus on emerging technologies in big data, Internet of Things, and AI, and applying them to solve the biggest challenges in Africa. Brian is passionate about the most pressing challenges within Africa with a particular focus on agriculture, food security, water, and sanitation. He's the founder and CEO of Ujuzi Kilimo, an agriculture technology company, bringing precision farming technology to small older farmers to produce more from their farms to curb hunger and food insecurity. He's also the founder and CEO of Hydrologistic Africa, Hydra IQ, the world's first water network operator, improving access, utility, distribution, and consumption of water using sensors and data analytics. Placidius Castus, the founder and CEO of AgriPoa, one of the most successful startups in Tanzania, is also joining us. Placidius is a great entrepreneur who joined us after founding a very successful data-driven farm management and farm financing software that uses data analytics to help farmers improve their production by giving them best practices, inputs, finance, insurance, and markets. Placidius' aim is to digitize African agriculture by making sure that Agripo becomes the bridge in the agriculture value chains and helps farmers earn more money, saves food for their families, and improves their living standards. Thank you for joining. We really appreciate your time. Last and certainly not least, we are honored to have with us Ed Sarber, who is the CEO of EDT US. EDT's Precision Pollination as a Service brings pure, clean, viable and high quality pollen directly to your orchard and applies it precisely at the right time to increase and secure a bountiful yield in your orchards. Join us on this discussion as we explore the power of AgTech to solve the planet's most pressing problems. This episode, we bring you a unique opportunity and intimate conversation between Africa's leading and emerging agri-tech entrepreneurs and a global leader in agriculture Paul, who led one of the United States' largest agriculture inputs companies for 10 years. I would like to start with Paul. If you can provide us a brief overview of your work and your involvement in precision farming in initiatives in Africa and beyond from your vast experience, where do you see the field is now and where do you see the field going in the coming years? Think both. Africa, as well as globally, it's still emerging and developing. There's still a lot to be accomplished. But specifically for Africa, Africa, you know, a little background here. The organization I was with, the Pod Pioneer, now Corteva, has done business in Africa for more than 30 years. So a lot of investment and a lot of knowledge, you might say, on the ground. And then when I was leading international operations, we acquired the business uh, Panar, which was also a leading plant genetics company headquartered in South Africa, but operations extensively through uh, primarily East and Central Africa. So it really broadened the footprint of, of Pioneer's activity. So what we were doing and continue to do in Africa 
is provide access to farmers for inputs. And that's all the way from seed and crop protection chemicals, as well as financing. So providing that access and then providing the management advice so that those inputs can be used effectively so that productivity can be maximized. And so, you know, that at a very, very, very basic level is precision agriculture, using inputs wisely to get the best outcome and managing those inputs efficiently to minimize your costs and have the least negative impacts on the environment. So that's the basics, but there's a tremendous amount yet to do. And what I would say is that, you know, particularly for Africa, you know, I think the opportunity for precision agriculture is even greater because you've got more soil variability, more fragile soil, certainly concerns about water access. Probably as we look into the future, climate change is going to affect Africa more than other geographies. And because of the nature of farming in, in Africa, I think it's more important to make sure that the effective use is made of the precious inputs that are in Africa. And so bottom line is what, what the opportunity is, is using precision agriculture to manage inputs and get the best output while protecting the environment really enables farmers to move from subsistence farming into farming for a livelihood so that they can make an appropriate income off of the land that they farm. Wonderful points, Paul, and thank you for bridging the subject of precision agriculture also with climate change. I would like to go now to Brian. Beside founding of Ujuzi Kirimo, he also founded Hydrologistics Africa. And I think it would be really great, Brian, if you could share with us some of the primary reasons that you think make precision farming crucial for African agriculture. And how do you see this has evolved in the recent years? Thank you, Abidio, and it's a pleasure to be part of this conversation. Just to pick up from what Paul has mentioned about the context of the African agriculture, it's generally it's led by smallholder farmers. And as we understand, probably about more than 70% of the people involved in agriculture are smallholder farmers. And these kind of farmers are faced with quite a number of challenges that they have to overcome to actually make agriculture more sustainable and a source of livelihood. Just to highlight some of the challenges that these farmers are facing, number one is uh, the effects of climate change. African agriculture is rain-fed and any disruption in terms of the patterns or the weather patterns that the farmers rely on to sort of produce food affects them enormously. And this is where an opportunity, for example, for use of a more precise kind of data to inform these farmers on how to effectively become resilient of the changing climate and the changing weather patterns uh, presents itself as a big opportunity to actually help these smallholder farmers. The other aspect is about the African soils. So generally at the moment, about 60% of the African soils are actually degraded because of the continuous poor practices in terms of soil management over time. And this drives down to how farmers, for example, apply fertilizer, how they apply nutrients to the soil and how they manage the soil effectively as they continuously produce from the same land. So I'll probably put in the context of what I do with Ujuze Kilemo. So we're trying to address the challenge of uh, soil degradation but at the same time, looking at the climate change aspect. So we've developed products that we call soil pal that is able to read the soil parameters in real time and provide farmers with actionable information on how to optimize input use for uh, at the farm level that it includes fertilizers, the organic options that they might uh, have at hand, uh, but at the same time also giving this data to the markets, especially the input providers, to ensure that farmers have access to these inputs in order to optimize productivity for the small pieces of land that they own. More and more, we are seeing that most of these smallholder farmers also need to take up irrigation, for example, and more so precise irrigation, which means that there has to be means a means through which farmers can able to get real-time data of what actually the parameters are on the ground, soil moisture, for example, but at the same time, layer that to the 
weather forecast so that they are able to optimize the water use at their farms. That's sure. Great. Thank you for your points, Brian. I would like to return to Paul. After retiring from DuPont Pioneer, you mentioned your dedication to advancing innovation and global agriculture. Can you share with us a little bit more about your vision for the future of agriculture and how ag tech startups play a role in it? And if you can link this also to the subject of today's podcast on precision agriculture, where do you see the most opportunities in particular for, for Africa as it is a key focus of our podcast? Right. As I look to the vision, uh, particularly for startups, I think it is very exciting because there's a lot of it of technology that needs to be brought to agriculture. And in fact, a lot of technology that has been used in other industries like fintech or medtech can move themselves directly into agriculture with a little more investment, broad applications. So I think the room for startup technology is just fabulous in agriculture for those reasons. And how it applies itself is, I, th I think, interesting because you know, for the most part, over the last 50 years, the world in general has addressed the challenges for food security. There's always going to be diseases, and certainly right now we've got conflict, and there's always going to be weather disruptions that, that cause a bump or, or a problem in food security. But for the most part, we have proven over the last 50 years that we can produce enough food for the population and the future population because of the productivity that we have delivered. So I think the next opportunity is to move from, we can't take our eyes off of food security first, but we can move from that being our primary focus to instead a couple of more things. Number one, improving the nutrition. Number two, improving the composition of the grains that we improve, uh, that, that we uh, deal with. And what do I mean by that? You know, generally grains are made up of oil and protein. And on both sides, we can, through crop improvement, through technologies that egg startups uh, can provide, can improve the grain composition so that it becomes more valuable for food, for feed, and even can be used in renewables like biodiesel, tremendously important in the future, particularly as we move into electrification and some industries like marine, like rail, like trucking and aviation will have a great problem in electrifying their industry and use biodiesels from renewable sources. If we improve nutrition, if we in improve composition of grain, if we improve our footprint for the environment so that it's less of an impact on climate change, we can get paid for that. Farmers can get paid for that. And I think that that is a better road to the future to get paid for the value that a farmer is producing as compared to solely be dependent on the volume or on the commodity. If we can do that, and clearly I think ag startups can do all of those things, improve the nutrition, the composition, and lessen the climate impact of agriculture. If we can do all those things, then the farmer can get paid increased value for the contributions that farmers are, are making. And th this transition that I'm describing, I believe that startups can lead it much more effectively than the major players, because the major players are all entrenched with their current business models, primarily focused on commodities. So uh, these values that are so important to not only farmers in sub-Saharan Africa, but also to consumers everywhere because of the environmental impact. Wonderful points. Thank you so much. Let me go now to our guest, Placidius Castus from Tanzania. I would like to invite him to share an overview of his company and how he's actually using AI to support small-scale producers. One interesting element, Placidius, it would be great if you can connect what your company does with some of the things that Paul just shared. I see a very clear 
connecting thread between all thoughts and also what both you, Placidius, and Brian are doing. So I'd love to encourage both of you, Placidius and Brian, to connect with some of the thoughts shared by Paul. So please, Placidius, welcome and would love to hear your thoughts. Thank you very much, Alvidio, for your introductory remarks. As introduced before, my name is Placidius Castus from Tanzania. We run a startup called Agripo, and we have built a farm management software to help now farmers to manage their farms, farm activities easily by linking these smallholder farmers with insurance providers, finance, plus markets. I'm data to analyze all these activities uh, to link these smallholder farmers with the services I mentioned and also use artificial intelligence to analyze and also advise the farmers on the best practices. For example, we started reporting farmers in the era of COVID-19, whereby most of smallholder farmers in Tanzania could not meet uh, the experts. It is estimated that the ratio of expert to farmers is almost one to 3,000. Now, it was difficult for these experts to visit the farmers physically during the COVID. Within. This is where we, we, we thought of using AI to detect the disease, which was the major challenge during COVID-19. The experts needed to visit the farms to diagnose the poultry, check the disease and those medications to be used by these farmers. We are funded by Vilcro Africa and able to implement uh, this activity so the farmers may get instant information to improve their productivity. This is the major challenge also affecting most of African farmers, the case of information and the case of disease, either in the farm, either farms, which is uh, crops and livestock farmers, they are all being affected. these issues. Now with the use of artificial intelligence, then these things can be simplified by making information on the fingertips of the farmers. This is how we operate now. Taking an example of our farmers who are poultry farmers, as I said, they are being affected by the disease. The way our software works is it allows the farmer to record their daily activities, gives them the calendar maybe, and informs them which date they have to do a certain task. They have to record the tasks. They have to record the expenses incurred on buying the farm inputs. And now later on, we use this data to advise the farmers on, on the market trends. We also advise the farmers on how much they spend on buying the inputs monthly or quarter maybe, or after a certain batch. We use this data to advise them and also use now this data to link proof to financial uh, service providers so that at least they can be sure on how much the farmers spend on the farm during the production. And we also use this data to advise the farmers on the market trends. For example, when the farmers start farming, they record that starting maybe producing a certain batch of cheese. Automatically, we understand that maybe Mr. Brian is in Nairobi. Uh, his farm is producing a certain batch with a certain number of chicks. And we are sure that Mr. Brian will be, uh, maybe after 30 days or 40 days, will be having the chicks in the market. So we use this data to communicate with our off-takers to make sure that they come in time to purchase these chicks before the farmers, they start spending more money to buy farm inputs or the feeds, which are very expensive. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you for sharing with us. Uh, just a quick follow-up question on you. From your point of view, for African farmers interested in transitioning to precision farming, what are some of the practical considerations when selecting appropriate technologies, equipment, and software, taking into the account factors like cost, maintenance, and scalability? I think as Brian said, most of smallholder farmers in Africa, it's almost 70 percent are smallholder farmers and most of them are women. And for these people, technology is still new actually to be honest in Africa and what we have to consider especially is language and simplicity because language is the very big challenge in Africa. You know, we don't have one common language. So when developing a system or a software, you must be specific in which maybe country you want to launch and you should start with a local language, which at least can be an added advantage to pick more, more, more users. Simplicity is also the very important thing because of most of these smallholder farmers are lay people, they are laymen. So 
they need just a simple thing, simple things, and do, they don't have time to click, go around, and around to do a lot of tasks. So they just need when they click something, they get the result. So if you are developing maybe your software, it must have very few screens to allow the farmers to reach where they want to go. The other solution, mm -hmm. I think making the farmers into groups because not everyone is having mobile phones which are smart especially so grouping the farmers in, into groups uh, by having a lead farmer who can direct other farmers or who can record the farm inputs by representing other farmers can be an alternative to solve this as more farmers challenges thank you so much Placidius. i would like to go now to ed I would like to move a little bit deeper into how data collection and analysis plays a role in your solution. How do you currently use data to fine tune your pollination strategies and what role does data play in optimizing precision pollination process? Yeah, absolutely. Data is a very important component or even a tool, if you will, to help solve any problem in particular with what we're working on. It's very, very important because just to have a concept to say that we're going to harvest pollen, collect it, clean it up, store it, and then reapply it later at the right time on whatever crop that we're working with is conceptually is a kind of an easy concept to think through, right? It's not that complicated. It's not, we're not trying to launch space shuttles, you know, off to different planets in the universe, right? But to take that concept, to take that idea and turn it into execution and turn it into something that is actually economical in, in a commercial setting, you know, we need data. And so, Everything from collecting the pollen, how we collect the pollen, uh, we're able to measure at the granular level, the, an individual pollen grain, how alive the pollen is, for example. This is a very, very important part of our process that obviously we're applying pollen that is not living. We're not going to, we're not going to germinate. We're not going to, you know, produce a fruit or a vegetable. And so knowing exactly how uh, we use the term viability. So the term viability is the term we're using on determining how alive a given sample of pollen is. We have done extensive lab research as well as field research to really know in a given sample how to measure that viability, but even beyond that, how certain percentages of viability will actually impact pollination or the pollination rate on a, on a given crop. And it varies quite a bit, actually, it turns out. And so collecting that information around the viability of the pollen and maintaining it is very, very critical to our process. For another component of how we're leveraging data, we actually just finished a, a trial on almonds in California where we're looking at different pollen varieties or genetics of pollen to determine if on a given almond tree, a variety of almonds, if we put pollen A on that tree versus pollen B in different amounts, do we impact mm -hmm. the yield, for example? And so obviously, measuring the results of that is very, very important. And we're, you know, leveraging the data and doing quite a bit of analytics in the research lab to determine, you know, the results of that. And there's kind of a third one that we're actually working on actively right now, which ties back to the timing of when to pollinate. It almost as important as the viability of the pollen is knowing exactly when to pollinate. Mm -hmm. If you're, again, just blowing, if you had very high viable, beautiful pollen that you're blowing on a tree or, or any particular plant, where it appears the flowers are ready to accept pollen, but they're not actually, because if you don't understand, you know, when the flowers are ready, then you're obviously not going to pollinate. And so we are working on a project right now. We're taking our lab and our field research at a small scale and to know when the right time to pollinate, let's say a pistachio tree, mm -hmm. and then scaling, scaling that up uh, using artificial intelligence technology coupled with satellite imagery so we can actually look at you know using global satellites right and using some of those high-res photos to actually compare what we see on the ground with what we see in these pictures combine that with the knowledge that we have in terms of the right time to pollinate so that we can actually build an algorithm to ideally automate that process so we don't have to have people out in the field looking at these trees to tell us when to pollinate so this is something that we're very excited about Thank you so much for the detailed perspectives, for the fascinating insight into precision pollination, a game changer for orchard cultivation. Now let's journey across the globe and shift our focus to East Africa. Ed just gave us an example from the almond sector in the US. 
emphasizing the critical role of data and maximizing technological advancements. Are there parallels in different corners of the world? To explore this, we're joined by another expert in the field, Brian. If you can explain a little bit about your company, Ojuzi Kilimo, the data-driven platform, how is your company helping smallholder farmers in Africa? And what innovative data acquisition technologies are being utilized? Ujuzi Kilimo is a Swahili word, which means smart farming, knowledge-driven farming. What we have built are two products. And we have covered both the data acquisition technology, which I mentioned earlier, that is called Soil Pal, which is basically a soil sensor that is able to capture up to 13 different soil parameters that includes the soil macronutrients to soil pH and also including the farm GPS location. And all this data is captured within less than five minutes of the farm. And it's sent to our online platform that we call FarmSort, where we developed uh, preparatory algorithms that are able to take in all these data and provide feedback to the farmers with very actionable recommendations about number one, the kind of crops that will do well in that piece of land or in that specific kind of soil. Secondly, it also provides the most suitable uh, optimum inputs that you need to apply for a specific kind of crop that you're doing uh, in that region. And thirdly, we use all this data to continuously monitor the farm using satellite imagery to provide continuous agronomic support to these farmers. And this is the information that we deliver uh, using a very simple means that is SMS to the farmers over the crop production cycle. So as a company, we've been working with farmers for the past seven years now, and we are covering more than 20,000 farmers within Kenya and Nigeria at the moment. And our goal is essentially to provide the most precise kind of data that farmers need at any given moment that takes care of uh, number one, the soil, and the, number two, the changing climatic conditions to enable them to become more resilient on how they do farming. On top of that, more and more we've realized that data is really key for decision makers along the crop production value chain. That is right from the input manufacturers to the market for traceability purposes. So our platform provides uh, the data analytics capabilities for these input manufacturers, especially fertilizer, so that they are able to actually get this real-time data of the soils and the distribution across different regions so that they are able to actually blend the right inputs like fertilizer for specific regions and continually ensure that farmers have access to these inputs. On the market side, we've been able to also provide this data to various market off-takers and sellers and players in the market, specifically to offer the traceability aspects and right now, as Paul mentioned, the nutrition and how crops are produced or how food is produced is becoming more and more relevant. And having this data visible and available for the market is really essential. So we are trying to create a platform that works from right from the production side to the market end. Thank you, Brian. One quick follow-up question here after I would like to invite. Paul to share with us some of his reflections on both Placidius company and also your company, Brian. Farmers in Africa often have limited access to capital and technology. Can you share practical financing models or partnerships that you think have enabled small-scale farmers to invest precision farming tools and practices? So the very interesting thing that happens within the farming context in Africa is that most of these farmers being smallholder farmers, grouping them as the like I just mentioned is really crucial. So most of these farmers are often in cooperatives and that mm -hmm. coming together really helps in terms of aggregating the, in making the services affordable or what I can call possibly sort of like sharing some of these technologies and tools to ensure that they are able to actually attain their goal of improving productivity. The trend right now among smallholder farmers is that they, through the cooperatives, they are able to access financing through microfinance institutions. 
and through that they are able to actually distribute the risk of non-payment or affordability for some of these technologies and tools that we're providing to them. The second aspect is really leveraging all on the technologies such as Internet of Things, which means that you actually are able to monitor and even distribute the payment model to pay per use rather than farmers going to source for capital to pay upfront for an asset or a tool that will enable them achieve uh, precision farming. So the pay as you go or pay per use model where you are able to actually monitor continuously the usability of a specific precision tool is really important. And it could be a simple sensor that has an upfront capital of maybe $2,000 that is way out of the reach of a single farmer. But by monitoring and regulating and monitoring, ensuring that they're paying for the moment they're using it, you are able to distribute the payment of that amount to as simple as less than $20 per month, which is within the possible income of that particular farmer. The third aspect is around bundling of services to these smallholder farmers. And by bundling, it means that a particular farmer gets to interact with different suppliers from input suppliers to labor to technology suppliers and the market players. So bundling your technology into all this sort of like creating an ecosystem around what the farmer needs and providing value for each of the players. A good example I just mentioned, like for fertilizer companies, we are able to provide value in terms of data and they're able to pay for that. For the market players, they want a platform for traceability and monitoring how productivity is going at the field and they're able to pay for that. By doing that, you are actually able to incentivize the farmer to access a simple soil test, for example. These technologies enable us actually to reduce the cost of the cost to the farmer, but at the same time maximizing the value that we are bringing to this farmer and the other actors in the ecosystem. Wonderful. Thank you, Brian. I want to bring Paul back in the conversation and they'd like to invite some of his reflections on, on both Tanzania and Kenya companies. And one of the areas, Paul, if you can also cover, how do you see the potential collaboration between established industry players and startups in advancing sustainability and productivity of some of these efforts? Right. Thanks. You know, first I'll make comments about what I heard from Brian and Placidius regarding their activities in Tanzania and in Kenya. It comes down to two thoughts that I have. And one is there are many people in many startups that have good ideas and good innovations. What I'd encourage those people in organizations to do is think of the problem that you're trying to solve with your innovation. Don't simply try and you might say advance or monetize your innovation, but rather focus on the problem in the people or the farmers that you're attempting to address and then make sure that your idea is addressing that problem. Really what that says is focus on the market, focus on the solution, and then bring your idea to solving that problem. So that's, that's the first thought. And then the second is, again, you come back to individuals or organizations, they have great ideas, they have great innovations, but oftentimes that idea or that innovation is maybe a small piece or a link in the total package that is needed to provide an answer or a solution. It's just one piece. And so I would encourage innovators to look to other innovators, other people, other startups for ways in which they can work together so that one piece becomes a link to another piece, becomes a link to another piece. Because in most cases, in, in fact, I would say in, in nearly all cases, a solution requires a systematic approach, not a singular approach, but a system approach meaning that you've got to bring multiple people, multiple ideas, multiple technologies together into one system in order to address or solve the problem. And that has the potential for a lot of benefits. Not only does it bring multiple resources together to solve a problem, but it also enables 
mentoring or learning from one another to occur. It develops relationships, which in agriculture is important to reach out and connect to other players. And then, like I said, it enables multiple ideas or technologies to be combined together or linked into a systems approach to address a problem. So those would be the two observations that I would make or suggest after hearing from Brian and Placidius is make sure that you're focused on the market or the problem that you are solving. And then second, try and bring others in to your approach so you can broaden your application and build those relationships that are so important. Uh, great points, Paul. And I think this does point about the systems approach is a critical one. My, our organization, ACDI, Voca and AV Ventures, we, we, in everything that we do, we have a systems-based approach. In Actually, in one of our future podcasts that will focus on scaling your venture, we do plan to discuss a little bit more about the systems and what are the other components that an entrepreneur needs to access and build so that actually can have a successful development of his technology and innovation. And let me give you an example. Uh, you know, I'm working on, on this one here in the United States right now, but it, this example works anywhere in the world. The startup has an interesting technology that improves the oil content of soybeans. So we are partnering with a seed genetic company for the seed. We're, prov we're partnering with a technology company to integrate the technology into the seed so that it expresses itself into improved oil. We're working with a seed producer to take that improved seed, produce it in volume, and then create a distribution system so that that seed can be made available to farmers. And then we're partnering with an end user, a poultry company, so that they can contract with the farmers for that end use uh, production that's got improved oil content that will benefit the poultry production. So that one technology, improving the oil, has a genetic provider, a technology provider, a seed producer, and then in, a seed producer that also does the distribution, and then an end user who does the contracting with the farmers. So the technology is great, but it needs to be linked with four or five others in that chain in order to bring it to the market and solve that problem that I described earlier. Excellent point. I may pick you up on this because we plan to do an infographic on precision agriculture. Would love to feature that example of a systemic perspective. Yeah. I think it will help our audience a great deal. Let me go back to Placidius, and we are uh, nearing the end of the podcast. Placidius, I'd like to ask you in your experience, what are some of the most significant challenges and opportunities for youth, for African youth in ag tech and agriculture industry, both in the rural part of Africa and also around the world? Okay. Thank you. I'm talking as an architect and as a farmer because as a youth, I've been farming since I was at the age of three to four. So I was born into a farmer's family. There are some different challenges which we face as youth and some may be access to land, but the most depressing challenges can be the capital, especially to youth and market fluctuations. Coming to capital, we are now being faced with climate change and we need actually to perform a climate smart agriculture whereby we need to utilize water. As Mr. Brian was saying, we may need solar pumps maybe, for example, to make sure that we have affluent access of water in our farms because we have experienced most of use using diesel generators whereby now we are facing a challenge with increase of petrol and diesel. But now it becomes very difficult for the youth to have access of money to purchase diesel and fuel to educate the farms. So these are the challenges which are being faced by the youth in the farms. Also, the other challenge is on market fluctuations. Our crops, you may produce the crops maybe today or tomorrow. The prices are not similar and discourage the smallholder farmers to continue farming because is a fluctuation in the markets. It is different from other farmers in, in Europe or USA, for example, 
because I've noticed when I was in abroad, when you buy a certain organic produce, maybe if it is cabbage, which is organic, the price is different. The price is high. But here in Africa, or especially in Tanzania, whether you apply organic fertilizers or inorganic fertilizers, the price is the same. You see? The other opportunities can be, the opportunities in the market can be maybe crop financing, whereby now due to inaccess to funds, to capital, then when you bring a financing solution as a bundle of solution to these farmers, then it can be a great opportunity. There is also insurance. We have noted that insurance in Africa, especially crops, crop insurance is not practiced. We have almost 97% of farmers are not insured. They haven't insured their crops. Now, this is a great opportunity for anyone who can chip in and come up with the good model for, for crop insurance, then it is a great opportunity in the market. Thank you, Placidius. In conclusion, I would like to invite each one of you to share in, in one minute what would be your advice, your uh, words of wisdom for the African entrepreneurs working in ag tech. Generally, having been working in this space for quite some time now, I really believe that precision farming is a very essential aspect of African agriculture in elevating food production and also ensuring that we improve the livelihoods of farmers. Anybody who's looking or eyeing to come into the space should really be looking at, I can borrow what Paul said, more of a systemic approach, looking at how you can collaborate and bundle some of these services because at the end of the day, we are all serving a single farmer and these farmers are faced or are approached by different suppliers of different technologies that are there in the market already. So it's all about looking at how do you then plug into the whole value chain that before you approach the farmer so that we actually provide a comprehensive solution to the farmer rather than just providing a single technology that might not be solving a comprehensive challenge for the farmer. Thank you, Brian. Paul? Yeah, very good. You know, what I would suggest is once you've got your idea and you've made that evaluation that I that I described earlier, that you are that you've got a problem that you can solve with your technology, look to a partner to to help advance it. You know, we're we're talking about, you know, the systemic approach, but look to a partner to, to get off the ground. You don't need to find a major player. You don't need a global partner or a noteworthy organization, rather just find a partner. It could be another entrepreneur, another innovator. It could be the local village or the provincial organization, the Minister of Agriculture, the Ministry of Education. Start with a partner and just simply get your idea out there so that you can approve and show and demonstrate. And that will, over time, get the word out and enable you to grow and maybe make your innovation or your idea then attractive to a larger player. And I should add, mention, because someone made the comment earlier that co-ops are a great way to get your ideas out. And, you know, so again, whether it's a village or, or a provincial location, a co-op is a great partner to have to uh, get that collaboration moving forward and demonstrate your success. Thank you, Paul. Placidius? Thank you, Ovidio. And what I think is the most important thing is collaboration. And when we talk about collaboration, uh, as most previous speakers were talking about collaboration, is about looking onto someone who has mastered providing a solution to these smallholder farmers in a certain area. Then I think when collaborating with this person, it can be a great key achievement because now instead of you to start from scratch, then you can use him as you are moving. So you collaborate together and move together to make a solid solution. Thank you, Placidius. Obviously, this is a very generous subject. It's very comprehensive and it's one that for sure we will see evolving a lot over the next few years. Thank you for joining us on this enlightening journey through Precision Agriculture on the Roots to Foods podcast. We hope you found the interviews with our guests as captivating as we did. If the future of sustainable agriculture excites you as much as it does us, 
Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform and share it with your friends, fellow entrepreneurs in the field of agriculture. Your enthusiasm and engagement means the world to us. And we invite you to help us grow by sharing your thoughts, creating sense reviews. Your support drives our mission to cultivate ideas that plant the seeds of change. Stay connected with us on social media for an ongoing conversation filled with valuable resources, engaging discussions and opportunities to actively participate in the market transformations we collectively envision. I'm your host, Ovidio Bujoran, and in our next episode, get ready to dive into another topic on scaling up agritech ventures across the African continent and beyond. We'll explore how entrepreneurs are scaling up their ventures coupled with cutting edge technologies that are reshaping farming landscapes across Africa. Thank you again for being part of our community.